So at this time, I'd like to welcome Mark Johnson and his team, and he is going to give us his final presentation on ESTCP Project ER 2009-17 on improvement, verification, and refinement of spatially explicit exposure models and risk assessment. Mark, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Andrea. And hi, everyone. Thanks for taking time to uh, join us today in this presentation. There are specifically two models we'll talk about. We'll talk about uh, the spatially explicit exposure model, or SEAM, which applies to terrestrial ecological risk assessment, predominantly, predominantly wildlife. And we'll also talk about fish ran, which is an aquatic model. And, uh, and with me is my co-presenter is uh, Dr. Katrina von Stackelberg. So um, go to the next slide. The rest of our team. Um, includes two others from our group, uh, Mark Williams and Mike Quinn, who aren't here today. I'm pinching in for them. Uh, Ted Wickwire from Exponent. Um, I mentioned uh, Trina. Mark Greenberg from US EPA was very useful in helping us understand uh, and try to model this thing to uh, comply with all regulatory constraints. Uh, Drew Rack from Nobis was very helpful. So was Ron Porter. Uh, Igor Linkov at the Engineering Research Development Center. Anita Meyer at the Corps' uh, Energetics Material Center for Expertise and Dave Barcliff. So the problem, well, uh, current ERA methods, ecological risk assessment methods, are likely protective but not predictive. And so what we really wanted was something that was going to, that we could use uh, to better predict what risk could be. And we saw a lot of issues associated with exposure for, for terrestrial wildlife, um, mostly because of two big things. One is spatial heterogeneity is just not considered. Typically, we take the upper 95% confidence level of the mean, that one value, and we run with it. We, we model everything based on that, because that's kind of a worst case of a s assumption. But we know in the real world it's not that way. Uh, we have all kinds of concentrations of whatever compounds we're thinking about. And it's, it, it does matter in terms of the way animals are exposed. The other thing was that habitat preferences aren't considered. And many of us involved in risk assessment was always, were always dealing with issues where we had um, an area that was suboptimal habitat, yet we were considering it very useful habitat for, for organisms that we were concerned about. So how can we basically develop a model that will consider habitat preferences and also the coarse grain ways that animals experience uh, different contamination levels in the environment? Um, we also, many of us weren't very satisfied with the fact that we were just using a single value, an ed hazard quotient, a number, when really we should be looking at risk, which is a probability, probability of an adverse event of occurring. And so we wanted to try to do all these things, um, but still keep within regulatory framework that we were needed to work with. And, and so many of us, I'm on slide four now, um, understand that the way we were kind of doing risk, we're really hazard assessment, was to monitor exposure, to model exposure in, in milligrams per kilogram body weight for an organism per day. I just use the raccoon as an example for uh, whatever compound, if we can say hypothetically lead, and this organism is exposed to the soil, to the food, to the water. What is that exposure? And, you, and we've, we've done this before, right? We do this for screens, and I think it's certainly appropriate to do that. Um, these models aren't designed to, to be useful as screens. They're designed to be useful, I, I would say, in baseline risk assessments in the tier, tier two or tier three stage, where you don't have that many compounds you're really considering, um, because it does take some time to set up the models, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But once you estimate exposure, then compare it to a toxicity reference value, a safe level of exposure, then, of course, if that ratio is greater than one, then it, we have more work to do, or if it's less than one, we can walk away from it. And that's basically because the conservative models or parameters, assumptions we use to go into that, that food web. So next slide, um, if we want to consider site-specific factors, in the past, all we could do was to develop an area use factor. That's what that AUF stands for. And there we did something uh, scientifically probably wasn't all that valid, if you think about it. We would take, say, our site's that small salmon-colored oval in the middle, and the home range of this organism is much larger. And we say home range, really we need to be thinking about daily home range, but we often don't do that. The only data we have are lifetime home range or maybe breeding home range, that sort of thing. Uh, but we did that anyway and, and developed a, a unitless ratio um, which considers uh, the relative difference between the size of those two areas. And then we would just cut that exposure by that, that ratio. 
And so, uh, and, and this is from a site that I worked on in the past. It's it's a, it's a um, firing range where if you look at all these different concentrations, it is incredibly heterogeneous. Um, and this is concentrations of lead in the soil. And yet if you calculate your 95% upper confidence level of the mean, it's incredibly high, a lot higher than the mean value would be. And so we really want to come up with a way that um, we could virtually put organisms in the environment, have them forage, have them spend more time in habitats that are more appropriate for them, and to see how that would change what those food web model outputs would be. And so this is the deterministic approach that we've been using um, and probably will continue to use, at least for screens. Uh, one of the big pros is that it's relatively simple. You can explain this to people. People get it. it it's, not, it's not very hard to understand. It, it does focus on a safe level of exposure, and it's the only way that I know of we can actually determine a cleanup level. Other areas, other alternative lines of evidence are very incredibly useful. Um, but that, these really are yes or no type questions. They don't, they don't usually get you to a, a how much is clean type answer if you do determine there's unacceptable risk. Uh, the cons, uh, and, and probably we're very aware that it does confound uncertainty because of all the assumptions that one must use to come up with a protective number in the exposure side and the TRV side. Um, we use that single concentration, talked about that before. We use a representative individual. What is the weight of that representative individual? We know that the animals probably vary in their body weights. Um, and also, we assume that exposure is uniform. So going on to the next slide, slide eight. We understood that immediately whatever we come up with need to be consistent with current regulatory guidance. So it, it needs to be consistent with ERAGs, and it must be something that we can explain to others. Um, we knew we were still stuck with understanding what exposure is relative to what the outcome would be and what the toxic effects are. We wanted to integrate as much life history and ecology as we possibly could, but the, the pure essence of ecology is to understand the interaction between animals, and I don't think we can get there with these models. Um, you just can't. Um, but uh, with that being incredibly complex, and we all sites a little bit different, even in terms of ecology. Uh, for the same species. And so we, we tried to improve it as much as we could where we could still be able to explain it to others, other stakeholders, regulators. Um, and also we wanted to, as I mentioned before, integrate habitat preferences. And more than anything, show risk in a, prob in a, in a probability type format. So you can show what percentage of the population could be affected. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, slide nine. Basically, uh, what it is is taking that same algorithm and just repeating it all over the landscape. Uh, again, um, understanding that we can wait where habitat is and where animals would more likely be able to go. Um, be able to predict that, that output um, for each animal, which again re results in a probabilistic output. Uh, we maintain it could be predictive. In fact, that was the, the focus of this whole effort, is to show that uh, it best replicate, re best replicate field situations than, than the other models would do, the deterministic ones. And yet we still had to come up with something that we could use to develop cleanup values if we had to. Uh, the predominant con in this model is that it, 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 it does assume that had it, habitat is, is static. It doesn't change. Well, we all know habitats change. And that's just the nature of the beast. I don't think there's any way around that right now. So moving on to the next slide, um, this cartoon here kind of shows um, basically how it works. If you assume that, that one circle is a daily foraging range, right here is a daily foraging range for an organism. And that organism, these purple dots uh, show a foraging event. You can have up to 15 foraging events a day. That organism can move across the landscape, and each one of these circles is a day. And it could spend more time in areas that are, have better suited habitat than, that, than other areas. Um, it can still go in areas of poor quality habitat, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute how sometimes, it, sometimes that happens. And if you assume that each one of these squares are an area of land that's maybe a different concentration of lead, for example, it would move across the landscape that way. And what you would do is, you would put a population of these organisms in a landscape uh, given a user-defined period of time, um, typically a season, typically makes the most uh, ecological sense, and, and see how they go across the landscape and experience the environment, and while, while at the same time 
uh, many food webs are being created at each foraging event. So moving on to the next slide, here's an example of one site that we tried it at. Um, this is a firing range. And in fact, uh, let's see here. you can see the berm right here. That's a, actually a one-click firing range. It's one kilometer from here to here. And there's certain leg concentrations that are associated with it. You could draw this right on the map. You can use any kind of map you want. It can be something from Google Earth. It can be a bitmap file. You can draw your own map if you like. We wanted to make it simple so that risk assessors, anybody could use it. You didn't have to be uh, an expert in GIS to, to operate something like this. And so um, what you also see here are these polygons that we drew here uh, with different habitats. And for this particular model, we did it for the eastern bluebird. And this blue area here, where the, the arrow is, is, is optimal habitat. And, and you can, these habitat numbers or values can be determined by the Fish and Wildlife Service Habitat Suitability Index. They have these from many different species. Um, they're intrinsic part of the model. You can click on it. It says HSI database right here. And you can begin to build that. Typically, they only want about three parameters. It's not that many. Um, Eastern Bluebird, however, is not in the database. Um, typically, more threatened and endangered type species are in the database. However, um, this is something that can be negotiated. It's much, much of this information is in the literature. And it's, it's fairly evident and reasonable to, uh, to project that this area here, this grassy environment, is fair, medium to high quality habitat for eastern bluebirds. That's where they're found in the breeding season. And so we, we gave that area as a, as a high. And so that was a, a 0.8 value. Uh, we also had medium. And medium was so basically three levels. High, medium, and low is what we used for this site. And that's what we used for the leg concentrations as well. This green represented medium quality habitat, which is the forested areas. And then low was wetlands. You typically don't see bluebirds in wetlands. And that was a, that was a 0.3. And so you basically define the number of individuals in your population. We, we estimated 15. And we clicked go. And uh, moving on to the next slide, this static representation shows those six bluebirds over a breeding season, their movements. And you can see just by the density of the circles, they spent most of the time in the areas of better quality habitat. Some of the times they did go into the medium quality habitats. And of course, they did go into lower quality habitats. Um, the only parameter that would keep them out of a habitat exclusively would be a zero type habitat rating which we didn't have at this site. And moving on to the next slide gives you an example of what the output is. And so once this model is loaded onto your computer, and it, fits, it works well with uh, Windows 7 operating systems, also XP, it also produces its output in Excel. So you also need Excel to see its output. It gives you charts like these. And so in this case, it's a different output, I think a different species. We have 17 individuals here. Uh, this is what their average intake is, that breeding season that we modeled. We also have a column for the maximum intake. And this, again, the, co the compound, again, is lead. And that's only because there is a hypothetical um, example where, you can under where it could, it's possible for one of these organisms to actually exceed an acute threshold um, in a day. And so we wanted to make sure that we didn't exceed any acute threshold. So that's what the uh, maximum intake is for any given day. And then we have, when you combine these intakes with a TRV, these are the HQs, if you will, for the average and for the max. So you can see for the max, a couple of these were, were, uh, were reached. But it also gives you an output like this, uh, this graphic, where uh, you can, none of these numbers, I guess, from an average intake level is greater than one. So this would be probably a site we would not do anything with. Um, but the way you would I interpret this is maybe 10% of them would have an HQ of 30.34 or higher. And we tried this out with, with birds uh, from a previous effort at uh, a couple sites, um, at McClellan, um, at McClellan's shoot, uh, Firing Range uh, 21 site, and also at the Aberdeen Proving Ground Long Distance Range. And here you saw, if you look at these different bars, these red bars reflect business as usual, the deterministic model. And you can see the HQs were, were fairly high the way they predicted it. But um, when we ran SEAM, it, it more likely matched what we saw in the site itself. And how we determined what the HQs would be at the site itself is we basically captured the birds, we banded them and took a blood sample, and saw if their blood lead level 
exceeded the TRV for blood lead, and none of them did. Um, it, some of them came kind of close. Cardinals came kind of close, um, but none of these actually did. So it seemed best replicated what we saw in the field than did a deterministic model. However, um, you show it works pretty good on birds, uh, and this is just two sites. What about other sites, and what about other organisms we typically model, like small mammals? Okay, now I'd like to hand it over to uh, Trina. Great. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. So this uh, sort of cartoon provides a uh, rough schematic of what the fish rand model looks like. So it's essentially the aquatic analog in some ways to the seam model. We start with the base of the food web where we have um, invertebrates in equilibrium, localized equilibrium with either water or sediment. And this is where a GIS-based uh, characterization, which is typically goes on for, for most site characterization, um, where we take advantage of exposure concentrations at these localized scales, and these invertebrates are in local, local equilibrium. And then through a combination of the diet or across the gill, if it's water, we have forage fish exposed, and then, of course, finally, upper-level upper fish. The model uses a uh, GOBAS-style engine. Uh, Frank GOBAS is well, quite well known in the in the uh, bioaccumulation literature um, as one of the sort of key models. And it has a probabilistic framework, which means that we use we can describe inputs with probability distributions instead of point estimates. And that really allows us to provide more information for decision makers and is also useful when we add in the, the spatial submodel, which is really at the, at the base of this. The probabilistic framework um, essentially assumes that you as an angler or an eagle who's diving for fish, um, when you're out there fishing, you are basically sampling from a population of fish. And so this framework allows us to model that population distribution of predicted uptake as well as the associated uncertainty bounds. That's how the model began life. Uh, then with the help of the Army Corps of Engineers, we were able to add on this spatial um, sub-model, which basically allows fish to move over a grid or polygons and, again, take advantage of that um, char site characterization that typically will involve GIS. So this little cartoon kind of shows you if the green circle is a site, um, you can have quite frequently spatial heterogeneity in sediment concentrations and water, but predominantly sediment for these heavy organics, which is what this kind of modeling framework was really designed for. And what would typically be done, um, for example, uh, not to pick on the Duwamish, but Carl Gustafson at the core and I and some others put together a report where we looked at several uh, of these mega contaminated sediment sites, so-called mega, mega sediment sites. And in all cases, um, the models were being driven by basically a single sediment concentration, which would either be an average, a straight average, or a surface area weighted average, um, but some kind of average. And you lose all the information about how fish behavior and foraging strategy influences uptake. In addition, you typically would lose if there were background concentrations of the contaminant outside the site, which would be in, in this little example, these concentrations. Fish Rand would allow you to model that if you wanted to. In most model applications, these would be set to zero. Uh, one other thing to note about Fish Rand is that it does, it's temporally and spatially varying. So if you have information about concentration, exposure concentrations in the modeling grid changing over time, it can capture that. It can take advantage of that. In general, these modeling applications tend to uh, use what, what is the steady state solution, and um, you don't, FishRand, you don't have to do that. So it uh, provides 
more information and more flexibility uh, in terms of modeling. So this, provide, this slide just uh, sort of summarizes what, what I've talked about up to now. It's a GoBoss bioaccumulation model pr primarily for heavy organics. It assumes that human and ecological receptors are essentially sampling from a population of fish and it provides that output as a distribution. We don't have a habitat suitability index and HSI exactly the way SEAM does, but we do have an, uh, a way of allowing the fish to spend essentially more time in particular areas within, let's say, the green, you know, within the, within the model domain. If you had information that fish particularly preferred this area, this would be tag recapture studies or even anecdotal information from anglers in the area. There's different sources of data for, for this kind of thing. We can actually increase the probability that fish will be found here as opposed to elsewhere. And so it's not quite an HSI in that sense, but it, there is a, what's called an attraction factor. And we allow fish to congregate in particular areas if you have data for that. Uh, as I said, it provides for temporal and spatial differences in sediment and water concentrations of organics. And what can be important here is the relationship between sediment and water. So for these heavy organics, we tend to think about sediment. It's, it's usually sediment-based food webs. It's the bulk of uh, predicted uptake is from sediment sources. But you can have situations where the, there's flux for whatever reason. Um, and so the fish ran model, because you, can, because you have this temporal component, it's not just a steady state um, solution, you can actually vary the water concentration for um, situations in which you have higher, you know over the course of the year that you will have uh, higher water concentrations. So we develop population uh, Species-specific body burdens, this is also referred to as the critical uh, body residue. And again, you can compare that to a single toxicity reference value, a, a CBR that is a toxicity reference value that is associated with um, a, a threshold below which effects are not expected to occur, generally reproductive kinds of effects. But because you have this population distribution, you can also do more interesting things like a joint probability model and actually estimate ecological risk to fish. And you have some further options because of the, the way the output works. And so having these population distributions will also be useful in um, consumption and, and health advisories, developing health advisories. So this just shows you a little, just a kind of cartoonish example of an, of an output. If you, this particular run assumes no uh, hot spot. It's, it's, um, there's heterogeneity and contamination, but there's not, uh, no actual hot spot. But just as an example, this shows you the um, ability of the model to capture temporal changes. And so that you can see, and we, we see this actually also if you go out and sample fish over the course of a year, um, you will see changes in concentrations kind of taken in the aggregate because of spawning and egg loss and this very variety of other mechanisms. Um, and you know, because you're able to capture concentrations over time, this model will capture those kinds of things. This just shows you a little bit of the output. You have a time period, and you can average over all different kinds of time periods. As I mentioned, the model has a probabilistic framework, so you develop this population distribution and uncertainty intervals. I'm not going to get into the details of that. You basically specify inputs as being predominantly variable or predominantly uncertain. Predominantly variable would be something like fish body weight or lipid content. Just like with people, we can go out and measure, 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 but there's only a certain amount of, uh, you know, there will be a distribution of body weights and lipid content in that population. It will never, you know, you'll, you'll never collapse it. To, to zero, of course. And so in this case, we have uh, the mean concentrated standard deviation, and then there's some uncertainty around that mean. You can also generate percentiles and, and uh, a, a host of other output, outputs from, from this fish ran model. And I think it's back to you, Mark.
again, just to, to rehash some of the things we talked about before, we wanted to incorporate spatial heterogeneity into the site. Uh, we also wanted to capture habitat preferences where we could. We wanted to do this for a population using seam, and we also wanted to try it with fish ran, take it to the field, see how we did. And we did it once with birds with uh, seam. But to this point, I don't think we've ever done it with fish ran. So that's what we wanted to do at a couple sites. So going to the next slide, first question we had before we even got into this model is, are we using the right models? Could there be other models out there that we could use that would be better? And so uh, we had a lot of, we had a workshop out in Menlo Park uh, in 2010. Um, we had a lot of folks there. These are some of the questions that we asked uh, the participants. Um, here's a list of, of the t attendees in addition to the uh, individuals on this project. Um, we had a good uh, expanse of experts in, in all areas of spatial, spatial modeling. We looked at ones in Europe that were used. And then we started asking ourselves different questions about each of these models, uh, given their approaches, um, their applications for risk assessment. Um, how different were they used in different regulatory landscapes was a question we have. Of course, the European models were a little bit different in their use there. Um, we, we thought about what kind of attributes the other models have that maybe these models didn't have or need to have. Um, we thought about that. And, uh, and then we made some recommendations. Um, actually, we came to the realization that seam and fish ran were the ones we wanted to run with. And we thought about some changes we would like to make to both of these models to make them work uh, in the way we hoped they would. So uh, our, our approach was pretty straightforward. It was like based on the work we did with the birds earlier for seam. Again, just do the same thing, except practice it using small mammals, since small mammals are uh, typically of concern at many sites. So we want to do that at least at two different sites and, sites and do the same thing for fish ran um, at, at Superfund sites. Um, moving on to slide 25. Um, how do you do that? Um, we're going to do it, we did it in small mammals much the same way we did it in birds. Uh, we went to the field, looked at blood lead analysis, um, and also compared that those blood lead data with a blood lead TRV, which was reported in the literature. Um, and then for fish ran, we looked at organic chlorine concentrations and the body burdens of different fish species associated with two different sites and compared that to, a, a, to, the, to the data that the model uh, produced. And what we're looking for is a greater than the order of magnitude difference. That, that was how we judged success. If it was better than a factor of 10, we thought we did a good job and be worthwhile to continue with. And moving on to the next slide, um, this is kind of graphical that depicts exactly what we're talking about. Um, on slide 26, we looked at small mammals. We put about 300 traps out two different sites. Uh, we collected blood from them. We collected some other information, too. We collected uh, gut contents to find out exactly what they were eating. We actually analyzed the, blood, the, the gut contents to get a, a site-specific bioaccumulation factor and see how that improves model output. Um, and basically, that blood lead data, though, again, we, we compared it to a blood lead TRV. Uh, we also, um, let's get this arrow going here. We also constructed the deterministic uh, hazard quotient as, as we would using the same input factors that we use for the species of small mammals that we collected at the site. And we also let seam do its job, putting the same input factors in the seam, except this time delineating, it, well, actually this time we delineated more than three different areas of heterogeneity for lead in the soil. We actually have contours in this, in this case. So we did much more finer grain approach to it. And, uh, but habitat suitability, um, we, did, we did do a low, medium, and high type uh, effect of that. And we wanted to look at the upper 10%. Since we have a continuous variable here, that was our number. We wanted to compare it to the hazard quotient and to this number here. Um, moving on to slide 27, uh, fish ran. Again, pretty much the same thing, except the differences. Instead of looking at fish blood, we looked at body burdens. Compared that to what the model produced, to what the what we got for uh, from seam. Uh, we could have also compared it to a critical body residue to get a hazard quotient. Um, we didn't do that, as far as I'm aware. Um, we didn't do that, did we, Trina? I think we just compared the, the fish concentration. We, we didn't um, because risk is linear, or well, it's not really risk when it's a single comparison like that, but ha ha the, the, the resulting toxicity quotient or hazard quotient is linear. It's the same. What you really care about is this predicted body burden. Uh, right. We don't have um, 
an independent measure of risk that is analogous to the blood concentration of lead the way that the terrestrial model does. So really what we care about is how well does the model predict observed body burdens. Exactly. It would have changed the, the ratio of the two. So uh, if you want to look to see what a conceptual model of seam looks like, it's on slide 28. Um, basically, the first thing it's going to ask you to do, and a really great thing about seam is it's, if you're familiar with doing ecological risk assessment, it's very intuitive. It's got a wizard side by side all the input screens. It walks you through what kind of information it's looking for. And if you've already done a baseline tier one or a screen, and, and you have organisms where you have um, input factors, food ingestion rates, body weights, um, daily foraging ranges, not home ranges now, daily foraging ranges, um, that information can be put in those screens and it walks you through it on the other side. But basically the first thing it's going to ask you is what, what time relevant scale do you want to work with? And if you're thinking migratory birds, again, you're probably thinking of breeding season. If you're thinking small mammals, uh, you, again, you're probably thinking the same thing. Um, but it's going to ask you what time period you'd like the model to run for. Next is what chemicals of concern do you want to run? Um, you can put in as, as many as, I think, 30 chemicals, but it, each chemical is going, to, is going to require a different set of polygons to be drawn. So um, it's recommended that you keep that number down low. These are really your risk drivers. These are the ones you want to model. Um, and, of course, if, at the sites that we chose, uh, at least, Insofar as seam is concerned, uh, firing ranges where lead is a big driver, maybe antimony, maybe um, vanadium, then that, that's easy enough to do. So then it's going to ask you to draw your polygons and define the site characteristic. Um, it's also going to ask you to enter your food items and any site-specific bioaccumulation factor or any literature-based uh, bioaccumulation bio factor. If it is literature-based, it's also going to ask you what that reference is so you can keep track of all this information. In fact, even when you start entering things like foraging characteristics or daily foraging range or food ingestion rates, that sort of thing, it's going to ask you for a reference so you're able to keep this information together. In fact, when it does report all this information into Excel, the very first page is a list of all your input parameters and those references. And then you're going to define what your habitat suitabilities are. There, there's basically the two layers of polygons you're going to draw. And it's very intuitive how you draw the polygons. You use the mouse to do it. Um, and then at that point, um, it's going to ask you what the habitat suitability indices are associated with each polygon and the chemical concentrations associated with them. If, again, you would just want to use the example we did earlier on birds and just do a high, medium, low and use the upper 95% confidence level of the mean for each of those, you can do that as well. Uh, at the very end, when it's ready to run the model, it's going to ask you to choose your population size, the number of foraging events. It's also going to generate a random number generator. And what that does is it basically randomly puts the organisms in the environment at least to start. After that, they're going to move based on their habitat preferences. But that number is important. You should write that down because that number is a way you can do some QAQC later on because giving that same number to start with, and they'll let you put any number you'd like to put in there if you want to do a, a self-generation number, um, you should get the same output. The output should not change. And then you run the model, and then you provide, and it provides you with that report. And I can show you, again, other examples of that. Um, next slide is 29. Um, this is a conceptual, was well, a flow chart that talks more about what we did at our sites. And so uh, we also did some work to try to make sure we had the traps in the best locations at the first site. Uh, we did a more uniform distribution. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Uh, we also collected a little bit more site-specific data we thought that was important. I mentioned uh, lead in the food items to actually calculate our site-specific bioaccumulation factor. We co-located that with soil lead concentration. Um, we also wanted to measure the amount of soil in the diet. You can do that by collecting, uh, again, the gut contents and look for the amount of mass in the stomach that's not food, or basically how much mass in the, in, in the, in the stomach is aluminum or silica is the way you determine that. And then you can calculate site-specific or species-specific soil ingestion rate. We did that as well. Moving on to slide 30, um, our accomplishments so far, um, we had several co-investigators working on that and sort of some contract mechanisms involved, so that was completed. Uh, we had the workshop, and we published uh, two papers from that workshop. Um, 
We had our site selection memorandum that was done, our draft demonstration plan. We have final user's guides for both. And those, at least one of them is on the, on the web, and the other one will be up there shortly. Model improvements. We implemented a lot of improvements at the workshops we're, we're discussing, a um, lot to do with operating systems. Uh, one thing we, they did suggest strongly, at least for SEAM, is that we include some kind of GIS framework. Um, that wasn't in my plans, but I thought, well, uh, since it came from the group, it was a good idea to use it for those individuals who had enough GIS data that you know, retyping in all that information would be extraneous. And so uh, we do have a beta version coming out that's, that's consistent with ArcView. So if you do have GIS data in ArcView, it will load it right out. And so basically there's going to be two versions of SEAM out there. One, it, you can download on your PC and go and, and run right away. And then there's this ArcView beta version that will be a module that attaches to ArcView. Uh, our field work's completed, um, and there's one exception to that, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, we had a couple training sessions that went very well. They were well, well attended. Um, we did populate our models with the data and ran those, and I'll show you some of those results. However, um, the models didn't perform quite as well as we hoped they would for small mammals. And uh, I'll get to those results in a minute, but it has a lot to do, we think, is grain size and the way these small mammals like rodents, like voles, experience the environment. So we thought, man, wouldn't it be great to have data for more highly vagile mammalian species like, like cervids, like, uh, like elk, like deer, um, bison. These animals experience the environment more of a coarse-grained way, and they might give you much better resolution. And so we did find uh, a colleague um, up in Canada who had a site. They were using lead as well, and they had some, some good lead data uh, that we could actually test the model on too, and they had it for species that Weren't, weren't large mammals like we had hoped, but they were medium-sized mammals that we didn't have. And so they have some data on rabbits, some hares, uh, and some raccoons. And so um, we're looking at those data right now. We're going to populate the model with those data and then um, include both the small mammal data and the medium-sized mammal data into a, in a manuscript. Cost reports and performance reports are done. I'll show a little bit of that. Final reports are done, and uh, we've got a couple peer-reviewed manuscripts in the queue. Next slide, 31. Um, we hoped for SEAM to try it at Fort Baker, which is out in California in Marin County. It's a great site on the other side of Golden, great Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, it was a site that was given to the National Park Service. The reason you see it crossed out is because we couldn't do it there. Uh, long story short, um, it's still in negotiation. And the National Park Service just made it incredibly difficult. They would never give us the green light. Uh, we've given them animal use protocols. We complied with every request they had. It just we just never could get a green light, and so we just plain gave up. Uh, we found another site at Aberdeen Proving Ground, a skeet range, that gave us the range of lead we were looking for, somewhere between 10 and 10,000 parts per million. Good spatial data, so we thought that would be a good fit. Uh, Fort Me was one of our original sites that went very well. Um, again, they went from 10 to 33 uh, parts per million, and I'll show you what those sites look like in a minute. For fish ran, uh, I think we also did a change. We went to a couple military sites that was recommended by the group. Um, one was Natick Soldier Systems out in Massachusetts, and uh, Trina will talk to that in a few minutes, and also Tyndall Air Force Base. Had good spatial data, very low concentrations of organic chlorines, but she'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, next slide shows you what Fort Meade looks like. This is slide 32, and uh, this color is basically based on the, the concentration of the lead in these areas. I'm going to go to the next slide, which is 33, and that's what the isoplets look like. We actually see the concentrations um, that represent each of these different areas. Now, uh, this, this is a, a relatively sophisticated way of, of mapping these things out. And you can get some, some uh, statisticians to help you kind of draw these isoplets. But that, that's not what, that is not exactly what's needed. As I mentioned before, that worked very well for the birds, is you can do a high, medium, and low. Um, but we just, we just decided more resolution would be better given the idea that these animals do experience the environment in a, in a fine-grained way. And so better resolution, we should, should have given this better data. This is where our trap location was at uh, the same range complex. You can see it looks a little bit different in the spring. This is all fairly well vegetated in this area. This is where um, most of the, uh, the, the firing range's points were over in this area, actually here. In the, 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 uh, the uh, clay pigeon spots were here when they fired, and this is where we found a lot of lead concentrations based on previous data. 
at the Aberdeen Gun Club, again, another skeet range, uh, these, these uh, dots represent soil concentrations that were GPSed in, and these isoplasts represent what those data were. Again, right here is where the ring point was. And this, at this spot, we decided to try something a little different. Here we mapped the traps, at least put the traps, in areas we were most likely to catch small mammals. So this is not a uniform distribution where we put the traps. This was a very planned distribution to, get, to put those traps in areas of ecotones where we're likely to catch animals. And you can see, here's where the uh, firing houses are. It's firing range right here, and they shoot out in this area. It's over here and over this way. Uh, some of the input criteria, uh, again, we had different references for different species, but generally this is what we used. Um, we used the Eco SSL TRV for lead, uh, for acute and for subchronic. So this was the acute daily max number, and that was the, uh, the daily number for uh, low effect level. And then for the blood level, lead level, we used Buchers et al., which was a very good review on the effects of lead in, in mammalian species. Um, Diets, again, this is some of the data that we use for these different species. We, use, we model least shrew, pine vole, and meadow jumping mouse. That's not what we collected, so after finding out what we collected, we changed these values and getting more site-specific numbers. Uh, these are the data from Fort Meade, slide 39, for white-footed mouse. Um, we saw that, at least for the acute side, uh, we greatly exceeded the uh, hazard quotient of one. So uh, basically, uh, and this is just a guesstimate from where I'm looking here, about 50% of the animals had an HQ greater than one for an acute effect. For uh, the red back vole, um, not as bad. Again, because these animals, you know, eat more vegetation than uh, than I guess the white-footed mouse does. But in any event, in any event about 50% of those animals were probably less than one or okay. 50% or more were greater than that. For the short-tailed shrew. Um, this is the chronic value. This is, again, still pretty high for the short-tailed shrew. These, these uh, insectivores are uh, predominantly predaceous, and so they had a higher number. Chronic value from Aberdeen Program for the white-footed mouse uh, was a little bit lower than the other numbers were. Um, again, about 20% uh, or more had a, had a quotient greater than one. And then when we compared the blood lead levels, um, what we saw is something to show that, yeah, maybe these animals are impacted. The white-footed mouse was at Fort Meade. Um, this, this green line represents what that, that Buchers et al. number that I showed you earlier was on this chart. The, red, the red-backed vole was actually, it looked like it exceeded that, that, that blood lead value. And uh, the white-footed mice at APG, maybe not, uh, but the short-tailed shrew at APG were. Next slide, 44, trying to present the data the same way I presented the bird data before. Again, where you have seam in purple, uh, deterministic model in red, and then actual down here. Um, you really didn't see a big improvement over seam over the deterministic model for these small mammals. And again, uh, we suspect that's probably because these animals don't move around a whole lot. So space isn't a big deal to these guys. Now, interestingly enough, uh, there was some some work that uh, when they heard about our spatial model, we shared it with them. Um, people with individuals at the EPA Region 8 and U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and they did the same thing we did. They tested out mammals and birds. And interestingly enough, they found the same results we did. Um, they found that for small mammals, not a whole lot of good resolution, but for birds, it worked great. And and they did a, a quite rigorous procedure. Here's Here's for the birds, again, uh, it's not in a chart, but you can see for hermit thrush down here, deterministic was 20. Seam produced today has a, has a quotient of about 0.23, and the field was about 0.35. Again, spotted toe e, at least a, at least two orders of magnitude higher than what seam produced and what they found in the field. And the pattern held true with warbling vireo as well. And so uh, it was really good to see that some other individuals tried the same thing and got very similar results. Here's the chart, kind of like what I produced before. Again, here's field, here's seam, and here's deterministic. And so, again, here's another example where birds seems to work pretty well on, uh, small mammals maybe not. 
they were much more in detail in terms of their polygons, the way they drew them, than we did. We just did three levels, uh, at least for birds. For, for mammals, we drew a lot more, and we used isoplasts. But they, they went way in detail here. And this is, these, are, these are their habitat polygons, too, so it's a little bit different than the chemical ones I showed you before. But they went in a lot of detail in drawing these polygons and determining you know, what, what habitat is what and what the habitat suitability in the sea should be for each different species. Here's another example from another site that they used. Okay, now I'm going to go to slide 50 and turn it back over to Trina. And now we're back on to fish. So just to give you a, a little uh, overview of the sites that we used for the fish ran demonstration, one was the Natick site. This is a PCB contaminated site. There were some PCB spills and, and so forth um, along the shoreline. And so you can see that this comes out of a GIS um, program that there are some sort of hot spot areas around and then there's um, areas of contamination that are that are kind of varied throughout throughout this site. And our Tyndall, this just gives you a really a broad overview. These are sediment sampling locations across each of the study areas. There are five study areas and based on where we were able to get fish data, where they had fish data available. Uh, we modeled several of these areas, but not not all of not all of the areas. This just provides you shows you a little bit of an input screen for um, the the Tyndall site. So uh, you can specify your areas, your polygons, or as a grid, or however you want to do it. And again, there's a time scale. In this case. We didn't have really much data over time. FishRand is actually designed to work well, I think as I mentioned, with a fate and transport model which can provide quite a bit of resolution over time. Um, so in this case, we essentially ran it as a steady state model because that's what the input data that we had. But here, here's where the, the time interval would be specified and it can be over years or, or however long. And it has a similar, I I think it has a similar, well certainly the guided input, you don't, you don't see all the words, but they're just as with SEAM, every screen has pretty detailed uh, instructions and of course there's a user's manual as well. And so if there are any questions, it typically is quite straightforward to kind of walk, it, it will walk you through it. Just to cut to the chase a little bit, and uh, this is maybe difficult to see, I apologize. Um, this is for the Natick site, and what we have is the deterministic. So I guess I didn't even mention the three versions of the model that, that we ran, I'm sorry. We ran a deterministic model where we literally did not use distributions for anything, which is how a typical uh, bioaccumulation model application would be conducted at a site. And FishRan can, can do it that way as well. So we ran a deterministic version of the model, and of course sediment would be described by an average or a surface area weighted average, some sort of average concentration. Then we have the probabilistic model. The probabilistic model incorporates probability distributions for everything uh, except for sediment and water concentrations, and those are not spatially explicit. And then we have the spatially explicit model, which is in green, and then we actually have the data in blue. And this is the mean of the data or the model output and one standard deviation. And basically what we see is that in all cases, and there's some tables that, that show this uh, perhaps a little better given the resolution here, uh, that the, the spatial model in all cases predicts better, uh, more closely to the data on both a mean basis as well as um, capturing the variability, um, which can be important. So for example, for yellow perch, you can see the deterministic model really falls you know, sort of sh quite short, um, but this is captured right on, and on a mean basis, it's you know, virtually, virtually identical. So expressed as a, a relative percent difference, let's say, um, the spatial model performed better in every case and also across an array of PCBs. We did total PCBs, a couple um, um, homolog groups, and then a couple individual PCBs that are often important, 153 and 52. And so these represent a range of KOWs and a, a range of behavior in the environment, and of course total PCBs being uh, 
a combination of, of a lot of individual PCBs. And so the model really performed, the spatial model performed better across different PCBs as well as across the different scenarios for the Natick site. Now for Tyndall, we saw something a little bit different. Um, I will say both of these sites, t fish tissue concentrations are at levels where you really wouldn't take any action anyway. These were not, they're not, not uh, hugely contaminated sites, T and Tyndall in particular was not, was not particularly contaminated. Natick, they did actually develop a bioaccumulation model, and we started with the parameterization for that model. But in Tyndall, they didn't even do any bioaccumulation modeling because concentrations are really quite low. Also, there wasn't quite the spatial heterogeneity in terms of sediment concentrations that we saw at Natick. Natick, there were a couple hot spots that really stuck out Whereas at Tyndall, we didn't really see that. And in point of fact, um, you know, the spatially explicit model, although it performs better um, than the other models in general, it still is not, um, it's not, not necessarily a vast improvement over, um, over even a deterministic model across some of these uh, DDX isomers. These are also small fish. The killifish and the pinfish, I will say, they're not at a size like the largemouth bass, so we're dealing more with a forage fish. So the com that combination of factors um, developed a situation where if you were modeling this and you were selecting what, what model you were going to use, you might not lean toward fish rand just because it is a bit more than you need probably for something like this site. But still, um, on a relative percent difference, the, the spatial model does perform better, but not necessarily better than, than any of the other uh, scenarios. This just provides you, uh, again, something from the output. So the model generates these percentiles. And in this case, we did just the population distribution if we had done specified, say, sediment concentrations or other inputs as uncertain, then we would have had 10, et cetera. We would have had uncertainty percentiles on top of this. So there's really, and of course, for each time period. So there's a lot of output that's generated. Again, you can collapse this in different ways. Um, there's a lot of different output options. This is kind of the, you know, if you want to see everything that the, that the model did, you can, you can do that and it would look something like this. And now I believe I'm turning it back to Mark. We're going to tag each other real quick here. Um, for issues and considerations, a couple slight issues. I mentioned one with the National Park Service, that was an issue. Um, hunting season, uh, we couldn't collect animals when they were out there hunting, so that was something to kind of put a kink in our plans. Um, active risk assessments, again, that was another issue that we had to tiptoe around. A lot of individuals uh, you know, have decades of, of work in a site, and when you come down and you say, hey, I just want to try something out new, it's research. Uh, they still really don't want you doing it and coming up with something that, that they didn't already agree to or already think about. Um, it just doesn't go over well, even if it seems to have all the scientific plausibility and, and rationalization as possible. It's still typically doesn't go well. And so uh, a good thing to think about if you plan on using one of these models or think that you might, um, get it in work plan. Uh, that's, that's definitely the way to go. Get it up front. Um, the other thing is we're thinking about uh, copyright and patents. Um, we'd love to transfer these models. I mean, we, we're, we're really interested in it. We think they're great. Uh, I think they're very useful um, for certain applications, obviously. Um, but like to keep these things going, and the computer world is not static. It, operating systems change every couple of years, and so um, it would be great if we could, could transfer this to a product industry that would say, okay, Department of Defense, you can use it. We'll give it, license it to you for free, but everyone else uh, will have to contribute towards maintaining it, and that way they can maintain their interests as well as ours. Um, funding coordination, well, that's, that's always a challenge in the government. Um, and again, I mentioned to do it and work these things into uh, work plans. So we did some, some work on cost assessment. I'll let Trina talk about this. Uh, and I'm going to go pretty quick because I want to leave some time for questions. But um, basically, it's just the cost of setting the models up. Right, Trina? 
Yeah, pretty much. So our assumption is that the GIS-based site characterization typically already exists. That's the whole point is you want to leverage that information. You want to take advantage of that information. So in the standalone version of FishRan, the, the modeler has to actually draw the polygons as opposed to being linked directly to a shape file. There is another version of the model um, currently, it should be available. It's being done by the core, actually, and uh, headed up by Igor uh, Linkoff. And that will link directly to a shape file for a lot of reasons we're not going to get into. Originally, when the core sponsored this work, they didn't think they wanted to force you into having to use a shape file. They thought it offered more flexibility if you actually drew the polygons. Anyway, in terms of cost, that would be the bulk of the cost, really. The food web parameterization, if, you're going to, if, if, if there's going to be a, you know, even just a deterministic model or, or some sort of bioaccumulation model done anyway, this would be no different. Um, there's a bit more, there's a, a greater level of effort perhaps in terms of distributions instead of point estimates, but you will often have lipid data and weight data from your, from your data from the site, and so that's a place to start and augmented perhaps from the literature. So that shouldn't really add any more than you would already be spending on a bioaccumulation model. Uh, calibration and verification, that can be a bit of a black hole. Um, it's difficult to predict, but that's going to be the case for a deterministic model as well. Um, and we're actually working on a, another project now to show that if you get these exposure concentrations right, you really shouldn't have to do a lot of calibration. You should be able to just run the model. And then there's a little bit of post-processing, not much. The output is generated in Excel, and so it seamlessly works with, with all you know, the Microsoft applications. Okay, cost estimates for seeing, I, I'm going to say kind of the same thing that Trina did. I've, I've been able to set this model up in, in two hours. Um, if I have the species-specific uh, exposure parameters in front of me, and, and in most cases you do. I mean, it's something you negotiate early on. And so if I have those, uh, it, it doesn't take long to draw the polygons, depending on your level of sophistication. I mean, if you really want to get into it and do like with the uh, Region 8 did and Fish and Wildlife and draw 73 polygons, and that's going to take you some time. If you want to draw three, um, it takes no time at all. Of course, there is some calculation you have to do based on the samples that were collected from each of those polygons in terms of that UCL, but it doesn't take that long. And that's, that's kind of how we got to this estimate based on uh, how long it would take to input all this information. Um, again, scale up, one of the issues, uh, it's going to depend on grain size and media samples. Um, I think it's going to work better, at least seem is, uh, for species that move around a lot. And if you have large data sets, we've got this GIS import function that's coming, I guess, in both models now that, that you could use um, that would help in that regard. Um, lessons learned, I think we've talked about it and hit on all these things. Um, resolution does appear to be improved. Um, with site-specific bioaccumulation factors, and that just makes sense. Um, some of the stuff that's reported in the literature is going to vary, depending on, particularly when it comes to metals, oxidation state, compound state. Um, moving on to slide 61, available tools and training. Uh, again, they have these wizards, I think, that are very intuitive. Um, anyone familiar with risk assessment shouldn't have any trouble setting these up. If you do, um, feel free to contact, email me, or email Trina. Um, User's guides are available for both and should be on the web shortly. Uh, these are the training things that we did. We also, I was able to um, get an invite to the Risk Assessors Training Conference in 2010 in Atlanta. That went over, went over very well. Um, I talked about the Canadian data we want to integrate soon. That should be available, at least the draft manuscript, by 2016 in January. And uh, Trina's working hard on that manuscript for the data you saw today, and we're hoping to have that later this month. Um, tech transfer, uh, we've had folks from all different sides help us out on this and give us their what they thought was important. Um, we continue to work with, with the EPA, at least Mark Greenberg's office in the ERT and, and Dave Charters. Uh, Fish and Wildlife, again, they like it. Um, some of the folks out in the region seem to like it as well, and so that's, that's good news. And we've been to the Tri-Service Environmental Risk Assessment Work Group, and there was a combination meeting with them and the folks at the uh, Ecological Risk Assessment Forum, and we presented it there as well. 
got some pubs out. Um, if you're interested in any of these, again, please contact us. Um, the first uh, three were a product of the workshop, and, and some others were uh, are either in preparation or uh, results of the data you saw today. Um, lots of presentations out there, too. So I'll just run through that. Fair look at the titles. Um, I believe that brings us to the end. Um, hopefully, there's some time for questions, or did we go too long? No, we we have time for a couple questions. Thanks, Mark. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, Mark and Trina, this is Tim Thompson. Maybe I missed it. What is your plans to make these updated versions uh, available? How, how will that occur, please? Well, um, the, the GIS beta version, um, we haven't gotten the test yet. I'm expecting that in a week or two. Once we get that and we got that tested out, I'm going to hand that one over as I did uh, the latest version of FishRan and SEAM uh, to the folks at uh, ESTCP. And I believe that's going to go on the website. Is that right, Deanne? Yes, that's right. So for FishRan, the, again, the standalone version is going to be available through ESTCP, and the version that allows you to actually use shapefiles directly is being programmed by the folks at the core, and so it will be part of the BRAMS, Bioaccumulation and Risk Assessment Modeling System. I think if you Google that, it will take you right to the web page. I don't know if it's up right this minute, but I know the plan is to have it available within the next month or so. And that will include as well a steady state version, not spatially explicit, what we used to call trophic trace. That will be in there. And I think maybe one other model that they developed for EPA that's also a, a bioaccumulation model. And they have somewhat grandiose plans to, to through GIS, link FishRand and other models in a decision support system. But for right now, BRAMS is going to have the latest, the actual version of the model that links to shapefiles. Or the standalone will be available through ESTCP. Okay. Uh, as a suggestion to consider, it might be useful when you assess what those models are just to provide a link to the program. And uh, Deanna and Andrea can decide whether to post that link on uh, uh, the project website. Absolutely. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, this is Marvin Unger, uh, Trina, Mark. Great, uh, great presentation. Uh, Mark, you had made mention that um, one of the concerns or or issues were uh, was that you didn't uh, uh, you weren't able to get samples of uh, biota uh, during the hunting season. I'm also thinking that depending on the season of the year that it may be, be it winter, summer, or, or fall or spring, uh, that the dietary habits or the eating habits of any of these species might also uh, vary. Uh, is this something that you considered or, or addressed within the model? Absolutely. You're right on, Marvin. That's, that's something you need to consider. I mean, optimally, we'd like to, to shoot for fall because then the animals are putting on fat. Um, we can collect right there at the site, you know, what they're eating. We're, we can do that in the spring, too. But in the spring, you're actually thinking about um, any kind of immigration that's occurred, had the animals moved from one site to another. Um, you typically don't catch as many in the spring as you do in the fall if you're talking small mammals because you'd like to catch a lot of the reproductive of the year, um, and that's typically what you catch more in the fall. Um, than the spring. We, we didn't do bad, though. Um, we, 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 just, uh, we just regrouped. We came back the following year, and we did it in the, in the spring and late summer, which wasn't bad, because uh, you still get a lot of young men in late summer as well. And, and you do collect different food items. They are eating different things. I mean, you can, right. you can determine that from the gut contents. Um, you know, one thing I'd like to do, if I had a wish list and, and you know, some, um, some resources supported, is, is to go to some of the hunting shacks where they are actually hunting white-tailed deer, get some blood samples from these things, at these sites that we've already modeled and, and see how that looks and, and, and model some white-tailed deer. I think that's relatively low effort and uh, high return on investment. So we're kind of thinking that and seeing a way we can try to pull that off. Is there also a possibility of, of maybe um, taking samples throughout the year 
finding out what variation there may be within one specific species uh, across the year, somehow normalizing that depending on what time you take it, when you take the samples later on? Yeah, I guess that's, that's all going to depend on the species you're talking about. Um, again, yeah. if we're talking small mammals, uh, I'm not expecting a whole lot of difference, to be quite honest. I mean, uh, it, it all depends on what's blooming and what's available during the time of year. Um, voles are going to eat vegetation. That's not going to change. And I don't think lead uptake in vegetation varies a whole lot uh, from one species to another in terms of plants and plant material. Um, Except that during the springtime when the plants are first coming up, uh, uh, adsorption may be, um, absorption may be, um, and uptake may be greater than later on. It, that's right. That, that could be. And also you're going to probably see a whole lot more inadvertent soil ingestion because they're, they're eating more of plant material that's closer to the ground as it comes up. I'm, I'm guessing. I'm assuming. Yeah. But yeah, I guess there would be some variation in that as well. Okay. Oh, thank you, Mark. Great presentation. You too, Trina. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, Mark and Trina, for giving the presentation today. I do really hey. appreciate you putting in the time for that, and it's definitely valuable to the program. Andrew, do you have one? This is Jason. Do you have time for one more question? Oh, sure, Jason. Jump in. Hey, Trina, uh, was that was the fish tissue samples from Natick collected before or after remediation? Um, before. Okay. I'd be curious. I guess they didn't collect any afterwards? Not that we got or were able to get. I believe, though, that maybe there is something, maybe, maybe they did. We didn't have access to that. But I will say that on another project, there are going to be fish data collected right, right now. In fact, soon, in the next few weeks. Post remediation. Post remediation, yes. This now would be they've done, they've taken some, they have done some, uh, they've implemented some remedial alternatives there. They've done they've definitely done something, and so this would definitely be post remediation. Hmm. That would be interesting. Um, that, that's that's the only question. I guess the the only other thing, Tim, did did uh, since. Uh, uh, we did a lot of the the um, not palm, but uh, the uh, what's his name did all the. I can't Paul yes, Phil. Phil, yes. Did, did we ever look at the predictive? I'm, I'm just curious if we ever looked at the predictive data from there from his sampling with what was the realistic data collected. Um, well, it's a it's an interesting question you asked, and Trina just alluded to it. Uh, project 201431, I believe, is the one, that, um, and I just finished reviewing the demonstration plan. Is exactly what they intend to do. They're going to go back out to that same system post remediation. They're going to collect uh, PE data, sediment, water, biota, uh, both pelagic and I believe benthic. Trina, if I'm not mistaken. As yeah, we're well going to do ev yep, every step, every. Um, Every step of the food web, actually. Yep, and then they're going to put all of that into the food web model, and we're going to we're going to check how well that could be. If we have improvement in uh, food web, uh, excuse me, biological uptake relative to just simply using the sediments, FOC, KOC measures. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Any other questions? Uh, Andrew, just one, one quick point I'd like to make that I didn't make in the presentation that I probably should have, is that this model is a really neat, I think, useful tool in asking what if questions. In other words, if you're to the point where you think remediation is necessary, at least the model shows it, or you're at a site and you think what is what makes the most sense in terms of where we should clean up and to what level, you can do that on this model. You can clean up a polygon, run the model again, and see if that gets you where you need to be. And that's relatively easy and quick to do. So I just thought I'd mention that before we, uh, we got to check out. Hey, Mark, okay. has, any, has, has this model been used at any place that, that uh, the ranges have been treated instead of remo the lead removed? I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think so. I'd be interested in what the pre and post treatment for bioavailability would be. Yeah, that's a good question. All right. <laughs> 
Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thanks, Mark. Thanks, Trina.